My name is Lauren Brenner, and I'm a marketing manager at Amplify. And welcome to our ed webinar, Science of Reading, Managing Change for Real Results. And now I'm thrilled to introduce you to our two guest speakers. Giovanna Mack is a lead content teacher of Caddo pa Parish Public Schools in Louisiana. She is also this year's 2023 Amplify Science of Reading Star Award Grand Prize winner. So congratulations again to Giovanna. And leading today's presentation is Susan Lambert. Susan is the Chief Academic Officer of Elementary Humanities at Amplify and is the host of Science of Reading, the podcast. And speaking of the podcast, we are so excited to be celebrating 5 million downloads. So be, be sure to, to subscribe at amplify.com slash podcast and season eight of our podcast will be released in October. So be on the lookout and join us in listening. And now without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to my amazing colleague, Susan. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you everybody for joining. We're going to do a few things before we invite jo uh, Giovanna up to talk a little bit about her um, amazing results and congratulations again to her for being a change maker star award winner. Um, but we're going to spend a few times, a few minutes before we get to her just talking about science of reading and what does it mean to manage change for results? Again, my name is Susan Lambert. I'm host of Science of Reading, the podcast. If you're not a listener, you actually can subscribe to the podcast on any of your favorite plat podcast platforms um, and share that um, podcast with your friends. We're going to talk a little bit about a few episodes that are particularly relevant for today's content. I also serve as a chief academic officer of elementary humanities here at Amplify. So today's goals, first of all, we're going to review some science of reading framework. So if we're specifically talking about managing change within science of reading, um, we're going to talk about those frameworks first to ground ourselves. And then we'll talk about some key drivers in educational change. And I'm really excited that I'm going to be able to present you with some resources that you can actually get right from Amazon um, in case you wanna do a little deeper dive. We'll talk about some stages of implementation, and then we're going to talk about how it's happening, which is when we're going to talk with Giovanna about some things that are happening on the ground in Louisiana, where she is at. Um, before we get started jumping into Science of Reading Frameworks, I just want to remind everybody that if you are making comments, you are asking questions, we just ask that you be respectful, um, both of the content and of each other. All right. So what do I mean when I talk about science of reading frameworks? So first of all, um, if you're not familiar with the Reading League, I really encourage you to Google the Reading League and Google Science of Reading Defining Guide. Um, the Science of Reading Defining Guide is a great little PDF that you have access to, and it will give you both definitions of the science of reading, examples of the science of reading, and even some implementation support as we talk about uh, multi-tiered systems of supports. And just as a reminder, the science of reading is a really large body of evidence, scientifically based research, and it's interdisciplinary. We're not talking about one discipline or another. We're talking about neuroscience and cognitive science and linguistics. So there's just a big body of evidence that helps us understand what it is that kids need in order to develop proficiently. And it's not just about reading, right? So the science of reading make it seems like we're just talking about reading, but we're not. We're talking about the reciprocal processes of both reading and writing. And this is actually nothing new, right? We're not talking about research in the last five years. We're talking about research from the last five decades and not just the United States, all across the world, thousands of studies. And along with that, we say it's a preponderance of evidence of how proficient reading and writing develop. That means we're not just taking a single study with a single result, but we're aggregating these studies together to look at them from different points of view to see what it is that kids need in their process of developing as proficient readers and writers. And finally, and I think this is the most important thing, is that we're doing this to understand how to keep kids out of needing later intervention. So prevention is the key here. Um, yes, kids sometimes need intervention uh, to move forward in their learning, but really we want to provide students with high quality programs to prevent the need for later intervention. 
So when we talk about the simple view of reading, what is it? And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I'm guessing that many of you have heard this before. Um, and again, go back to the Science of Reading Defining Guide, or you can hit up the Amplify website that also has some resources and explanation about the science of reading. But when we talk about the science of reading, one of the frameworks we base it on is what we call the simple view of reading. And the simple view of reading essentially says that skilled reading is a product of two factors, language comprehension and word recognition. These two capacities are super important to develop in our students, and you actually can't be a skilled reader without those two capacities. Language comprehension is the thing that develops naturally. Um, we come into the world as babies being natural communicators and take in all of this information uh, in terms of the sounds of the language and the words of the language. And pretty quickly, we start to mimic that language. This language comprehension grows throughout our lifetime. Um, and again, we are just been, our brains have naturally evolved to be language comprehenders. Word recognition, on the other hand, is not a natural process. You must be taught to recognize words on the page. And so we do that through explicit and systematic instruction um, to ensure that students have access to both language then and word recognition. Obviously, if you recognize a word on a page, but you don't understand what that word means, you want your skilled reader. So we need both of these competencies to actually develop as skilled readers. We also often use Scarborough's rope, um, and I like to refer to this as the strands of early literacy development. These strands sort of further unpack what it means to both be a, be a great with language comprehension and be great with word recognition. And just an FYI, sometimes people say, oh, you know, you science of reading people, all you care about is phonics. And that's not true. Um, you know, building background knowledge and vocabulary, understanding how sentences work together, all of those things to help students build mental models um, to see what that text means on the page. So we know we need both things, right? We need to understand language and we need to understand words as they're represented on the page. One thing that I just wanna remind everybody about is before Scarborough's Rope even starts in the strands, um, kids need oral language development, and that strong oral language development helps them with both language comprehension and with word recognition as they start to hear the sounds of the language. All right, we could go on with the science of reading frameworks forever, but we're going to stop there because really this is all about how do we take what the science of reading and the body of evidence is and put it together to really create a healthy literacy system. And what I want to talk to you about today is that creating a healthy liter literacy system is about more than just understanding the science of reading, right? It takes dedication and it takes effort um, and it takes some change. So let's talk a little bit about first about these key drivers in educational change. Now, you will get access to this recording later, um, but I'm going to talk you through some resources that you can actually get to help you dive in a little bit more. Um, and for those of you that may be listening to this recording as a podcast after, no worries, I'm actually going to uh, talk you through those resources. Before we get started though, um, I'd love to read part of this piece called Knots. And I think as I read it, you can probably relate to this and think about educators in your system that also can relate to this. So Knots. There's something I don't know that I'm supposed to know. I don't know what it is I don't know, and yet I'm supposed to know it, and I feel I look stupid if I seem not to know and not to know what it is I don't know. Therefore, I pretend to know it. This is nerve-wracking since I don't know what I must pretend to know. Therefore, I pretend to know everything. I feel you know what I'm supposed to know, but you can't tell me what it is because you don't know that I don't know what it is. You may know what I don't know, but not that I don't know it, and I can't tell you, so you will have to tell me everything. And I love that because, especially in this world of the science of reading, it sort of feels like 
if you're if you don't understand what we mean by the science of reading right now and everybody else around you is talking about it and maybe you have an educational system that says we're getting ready to move to the science of reading or you're standing in a district leadership position and you hear other places talking about making a shift to the science of reading and you have no idea what it is people are talking about you can probably relate to this so I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking about the drivers for educational change, because nobody should ever have to guess about what's happening and what the next steps are. So when we're thinking about key drivers, first of all, the foundation should always be communication and conversation. This shouldn't be top-down mandates. This shouldn't be here, just go execute on A, B, C, D. Because a lot of times, thinking back on that knots poem that we just read, people are not, oh yeah, I'm going to say it, knots and knots. People do not understand all the time just from words on a page. And as a matter of fact, sometimes we think the thing that motivates them is maybe fear or maybe just laying out the facts is going to motivate them. Or maybe if I just hold them accountable and use some kind of force. Um, all of those things, all of those F words, if you will, um, facts, fear, and force actually don't help move things forward in terms of drivers of educational change. There's three things that are really critical, which is process, practice, and then remembering the people. So let's start first with process. And um, for, the, for process, I'm using as my reference this book called Build to Impact, um, mainly written by uh, Hamilton, but Doug Reeves, um, John Hattie had, a, had authorship in this. And it talks about some critical process considerations. First of all, the problem. You have to identify and investigate the key issue. If literacy is your key issue and you're getting ready then to make a shift to more science of reading based practices, you have to really understand that key issue um, and, and make a plan for it. The second critical process considerations is that plan. And of course, you have to make a focused plan, but how many people think about deprioritizing initiatives? So often we're doing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, but we forget to communicate what things we aren't going to do. And so deprioritization is super important. And then in that process consideration, you have to think about progress reviewing your plan and adjusting it if you need to adjust it. Just because we have a plan set out doesn't mean we have to stick to that plan. There may be times when we need to adjust. I really um, highly recommend this book, Building, Im Im Building to Impact, because it's a real playbook for educators to be able to understand how to go through this process. And a couple of quotes from this book. First, we need processes that enable systems, schools, and teaching teams, so all levels of the system, to systematically discover your most pressing needs. And I'm assuming if you're thinking about shifting to science of reading-based practices, literacy may be your most pressing need. And so you need to better understand how to appropriate then high-impact strategies and, and approaches to that. And then just a reminder that the idea is these things, these processes should help you bring that evidence to life. So as you're thinking about science of reading-based evidence, you need to think about, first of all, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't say, well, that's never going to work in my context. But also at the same time, you need to make sure you think about your context in terms of relevant improvements and, and what you need to make um, in terms of the processes. So the second thing we want to talk about is actually practice. And, and Michael Fullan's book, The New Meaning of Educational Change, is an amazing book to really talk about how to change practice at the school level and at the classroom level. And we're going to talk here, you see on the slide, about curriculum as being one of those ways that we can change practice. But you can also think about, in the science of reading sort of context, you may be implementing a new assessment method, or you may be implementing multi-tiered systems of supports and looking at tiered instruction. Um, whatever it is, 
when you're implementing a change of practice, you have to ensure that there's a deep knowledge of the material of whatever program you're going to be implementing or changing. And I think often this is overlooked, this idea of deep knowledge. Um, Deep knowledge will help change behavior because you will be able to understand what's intended by the curriculum or the assessment, whatever you're doing, what's intended. And so we can look at the teaching learning process and gain that deep knowledge of what's intended by that thing that you're implementing, whether it be your curriculum, a new assessment, or something like that. And why this is really important is that because we want to make sure then that educators experience a change in beliefs based on a behavior change. So what we do know is that when when we ask people to change, Usually it's not your belief system that changes, it's your behavior first, and then you actually see the results or the outcomes. So when we think about practice, I think these orange words here are really important. Deep knowledge is very critical. What is intended by the program you're intending to change or by the curriculum you're intending to change? And then how can we then experience a change in beliefs because of the outcomes that we're seeing. A couple of quotes from this book, change will always fail until we find some way of developing infrastructures and processes to engage teachers in developing and and applying. So you think about that infrastructure or that process that, that goes back to that first sort of driver of change, which is process. Um, And again, Michael Fullen will reiterate, I am not talking about surface meaning, but rather deep meaning to new approaches. So you can't just try a new practice one time or even for a week or even for a month and think that you have deep meaning or deep learning about that. It it actually takes time. And we're going to look at that timeline and what's involved in that in a minute. And finally, this driver called people, right? People are so important to this process. And I mentioned those three F words earlier in the presentation, the facts and fear and force. Um, Alan Deutschman in this book, Change or Die, and this is a classic book from the early 2000s, really talks about that's what we think actually changes people's minds is just give them the facts. And of course, the facts are going to help change people's minds. But we know that that's not true. I love the subtitle of this book that says, could you change when change matters most? We're going to look at a quote from this book in just a minute, but actually the answer is probably not. Um, And what do we need to do then to help people get on board with change or develop people to come along in the process? This book outlines three critical things. First of all, we need to provide people with new hope, which requires an act of persuasion. And I call that selling. You need to get people on board with what you're attempting to do. Now, that doesn't mean that they need to fully wholeheartedly believe in it, but you have to persuade them to try. And once they try, you have to give them new skills, which requires new knowledge. And this means professional development. We have to give people the information they need to have to implement that thing you're asking them to do. And it's not just new skills we need to give them. So think back to that full end quote about developing depth of knowledge. We need to help them with new thinking which requires recognizing the impact of the skills. So that means in the example of curriculum, we know the curriculum really well. We're going to teach it to you. We're going to come alongside and give you professional development with this curriculum or this assessment. And then we're going to help you see how that curriculum is actually implemented in the classroom and sit alongside you and coach you through this process of, of new impact using these new skills. And so If you're thinking about this developing people or helping people change, you can see that it takes time and it takes commitment and it takes investment in the people that you're asking to make this change. What if a well-informed trusted authority figure said you had to make a difficult and enduring change in the way you think, feel, and act? 
Could you change when change really mattered? Yes, you say. Try again. Yes? You're probably deluding yourself. That's what the experts say. They say that you wouldn't change. You don't believe it? You want odds? Here are the odds that the experts are laying down. They're scientifically studied odds, nine to one, and that's nine to one against you. And this book dives into people that have had heart attacks that need to change their physical behaviors, their physical approach. Guess what? Nine to one, they don't change that. And so when people are faced with change or die and they don't make the change, you can see how hard it is then for people to be making the change when their life is not on the line. So what do we do about that? Well, we have to think about this entire process in stages of implementation. And this comes from implementation research, research, a synthesis of the literature. I encourage you to Google this as well. This is just a great monograph that has stood this test of time that really talks about how they looked at the implementation literature to provide some recommendations and a framework in terms of thinking about implementing and changing practices. And what they will say here in my orange, you can see that, is the rigors of attempting to implement practices and programs and agree that the challenges and complexities of implementation far outweigh the efforts of developing the practices and programs themselves. Now think about that for a minute. And as educators, I'm sure that you can relate to that. So we can have district leaders uh, behind closed doors sort of spinning up new practices and new programs that they're going to dispel to the um, educators that are going to have to implement these things. And what this research will tell us is the implementation part is a lot harder and there's a lot more challenging aspects of it than actually developing it. And I'll even go one step further to say, as um, the chief academic officer of a company that develops curriculum and assessments based on the science of reading, I understand that it's a lot easier for us to develop these programs to give to you to try to implement, and it's a lot more complex for you to implement these programs because of the complexities of each of your uh, localized um, situations. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy for us to create practices and programs, whether you're at the district office or whether you're a publisher of materials, but there are a lot of complexities when we're thinking about implementation, and it actually takes time. So we're going to look through these stages, um, and I wish I could have animated these, but unfortunately, we can't do that. Um, so we'll talk through how you need to explore things first and really think deeply about them before you adopt them. And when you adopt them, it's a different process than when you start to implement. You get to the stage called full operation when you actually understand the program then you're attempting, attempting to, to uh, implement. And then you can start innovating after you completely understand it. And then you have to think about sustainability. So you can see along the bottom of this slide, we're talking about three stages that have something to do with initiation of these program goals, or what I called selling the idea to the people you're implementing with. You have this implementation piece of it with uh, professional development that you need to provide to support the people that are doing the work. And then you have this idea of continuation or coaching, um, because once you implement a program, if you want to sustain it, you have to continue to come back, um, retrain other people, look at how it's, uh, how it's performing. And so you can't just say this is a one and done proposition. Okay, really quickly, we're going to walk through these stages. So I usually say year zero to one. So these are sort of baseline years is when you're going to be involved in what we call this initiation process. This idea that you're going to bring people on board with the program that you're going to uh, be, uh, be implementing. So whether that be a curriculum program, whether that be an assessment program, whether that be some kind of literacy program you have yourself, you're first going to explore the idea. 
So you should never skip over this exploration stage. This exploration stage is all about what are your key goals of this? What are you going to de-implement? How are people going to understand um, this, this thing that you're going to adopt? When you decide and make that decision is when you move to the adoption phase. And usually we think about this as, oh, I'm adopting a new curriculum program. But it could be you're adopting a new approach to literacy instruction itself. And so you have to really identify and name the thing that you're adopting. And you'll need to think about all the contingencies for this adoption. How are you going to train people? How are they going to get materials, right? So all of those details come in that adoption um, process. And then the next thing is implementation. And when we think about implementation, we think about clear communication of what the expectations are. We think of training staff members, educators on the program they're implementing. Um, and so that's sort of all the initial stages of, of implementation from explore to adopt to what we call the initial implementation. Maybe you think, oh, that's it. We got to implementation. We're good. But that's really only the first stage because the next several years, and this can range depending on who you are, what you're implementing, and, and how well things are going, is what we call the actual implementation stage, which needs a lot of professional development. Notice I didn't say training. This is really development um, in terms of how this program or practice is going to roll out. And so you see implement is also in this. So that initial implementation is the beginning of this implementation stage. And I often say it usually takes an entire school year to see the ebb and flow of whatever practice you're implementing, whether that be, it is, doesn't even have to be literacy-based, right? Maybe it's a new lunch program that you're implementing. You have to see the entire year of the ebb and flow of that. Um, but for sure, for anything related to a literacy program, if it's a new assessment, you have to understand what that looks like from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year to the end of the year. If it's a new curricula, you need to understand what that curricula looks like for the entire instructional range of all that's happening from the beginning to the end of the year. And until you get that full experience, that full year experience, you can't really move into what we call full operation stage. And full operation stage is saying, ah, I get this thing, I get this curriculum, I get this assessment from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. I've seen all that it's attempting to do in the full cycle of events. Um, and now that I understand it, I can say, how well is this working in my context? And that moves us to the innovation stage, which is what do I need to change about this, if anything, to better meet the needs of the students in my classroom? Now, I'm not saying that you can't make some of those modifications in full operation. What I'm saying is don't change the rules of the game until you learn the game. And so you have to see that thing all the way through and then be able to innovate in areas and then see how that innovation actually impacts. So that's years one through three. And then continuing then, the coaching will continue all the way through, right? And so coaching doesn't just start um, where the training stops. They actually are a little bit of an overlap. So we see that in the implementation stage, we should be starting with coaching, full operation stage, we should be continuing with the coaching, and the coaching should actually be ongoing all through sustaining this impl implementation over time. And why is that important? Well, that's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, you have a different group of students every year coming through, right? And you may not have encountered certain situations, and so the coaching needs to continue. You may have new programs that come in that are um, maybe distracting from what's happening in the literacy program, continuing to coach, right? So coaching should be an ongoing system, and you notice how I say three plus years, so you need to continue that coaching over time. And I often say that literacy goals aren't 
one and done. Literacy goals should always be on the agenda for school improvement uh, because we always have a new group of students coming in. And particularly at the early grades, literacy is really the keystone to students' um, educational success. So let's look at this whole thing again um, in terms of a visual. We're going to go through all stages of, these, of this process from explore to adopt to implement to full operation, innovating and then sustaining the work. And this happens over time. And so you know, there's overlap in each one of these sort of buckets of or stages. The thing that I want you to really understand is that, again, you can't just have literacy implementation goals for one year and think that you have completed it. It takes time for people to actually understand what's happening in the implementation, uh, have their have their um, questions answered, be able to see what this looks like in the classroom. Um, and so it's a commitment over time. Okay, so a couple of things. First of all, if you've heard the Doug Reeves episode, season six, episode three, you know that it's full of just great wisdom and information. I will tell you, Dr. Doug Reeves has been doing this implementation work for years and years and years the number of resources and books that he has produced to support people in this work is incredible. Um, I would agree that you should go back and re-listen to this uh, episode if you're interested at all in implementation. He reminds us of two really important things. If you're not in it for deep implementation, which requires a level of focus, allocation of time, allocation of resources, don't bother doing it. If you're not going to be committed to this, then it probably isn't key, right? Remember way back to the beginning, we talked about processes. What's the most important thing that you need to change? If it's not that important to take it to deep, to deep implementation, then don't bother because we don't have all the time in the world and we don't have all the resources. And the second thing, you have to have a singular focus. It's got to be sustained year after year after year until it becomes part of your culture. And that was the previous slide where we talked about these stages of implementation. It has to be part of your culture, and that takes a long time uh, to be able to make that happen. So go back and listen to, those, to that episode. It's, it's really critical. Two other episodes I'll recommend. Um, in season one, we talked with Dr. Sean Joseph. This is a great episode, as well as in season two, Dr. Latanya Goffney, episode one. Both have their own take about how they built towards implementation and things that were successful and things that weren't. And um, I think you can listen to these two episodes and really get some contrasting uh, viewpoints or information um, in, in terms of these in terms of these two. Um, I'm going to my Q&A really quick just to see. Um, all right, I think some of these we can answer. So we are going to move on to how it's happening. And so with that, I would love to bring up on screen if we can bring Giovanna up on so we can talk with her a little bit. There you are, Giovanna Mack, welcome. Hello. Hello, Congra hello, hello. Congratulations again on your award winner. Um, Thank in, you. So I would love, Giovanna, if you could just tell folks a little bit about who you are and where you're located before we jump into talking about the science of reading shift that y'all made. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Giovanna Mack. I am from Caddo Parish Schools here in Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, this is my 13th year with Caddo, my 21st year with the state of uh, Louisiana, and I am a lead content teacher slash instructional coach in our district. Wow, great. We have a question about coaching that we're actually going to get to in a minute, but can you talk a little bit about your shift to science of reading and some of the challenges y'all faced? Okay. Well, my personal shift um, began in like 2018 for me. Um, working with, um, she's retired now, but Dr. Carolyn Gore um, here in Shreveport, along with Janice Weissgood. So they began my personal journey into the science of reading, leading me to get fully trained 
um, trained through letters. And then here recently in our district, we made a big push um, in the last two years to the science of reading after being with um, Amplify with CKLA since around 2018. So in the past two years, our district started an initiative to get everyone, uh, anybody that teaches reading in any capacity trained in the science of reading through Ames Institute. And the thing that I'm most impressed about my district doing is that we took what I call a top-down approach from the district um, level on down to the, the classroom everybody has gone through Ames Institute or is in the process of going through Ames Institute. And so that is amazing because um, that really has created a shared understanding of the importance of the science of reading, importance of a systematic, explicit way of having literacy instruction, and then created a common language that we can all use. And so when you say certain terms now, it's not, as I call it, deer in headlights. Everybody yeah. kind of can speak that same, same language. And so that's a good thing. Um, and that's something, once you get your leaders on board, um, especially at the district level, I mean, we have executive directors who have gone through Ames Institute here in our district. And so that is impressive. So I'm very proud of that as being a part of our cattle school system. And then seeing classroom teachers also going through that. So the importance of that is that when we speak the same language, when we're coaching, we're out in the field working with teachers, we understand each other. We understand the need. And then we can directly address it, speak to it, and make some decisions. Hmm. That's I think that's really, really important. And we under, oh, I don't know what the word I have for it right now, but um, but we don't, I guess, language, because I think especially in education, even as we're talking about the science of reading, you know, somebody in the in the chat just says, What does shift to the science of reading mean? I missed the first 15 minutes. And um, right. encourage you to go back and watch the beginning of this presentation, right? But um, by science of reading, we do mean a body of evidence, but there are certain practices and certain things that we know actually support that body of evidence in terms of what kids need in the classroom. But my favorite, Giovanna, is, you know, words like differentiation and things like that. Yes. Like we, a lot of us just use these words and we don't understand what they mean. So just that training is really helpful to get everybody on the same page. Yes, exactly. What about some of the challenges you encountered? So I hear like all the focus on professional development and, you know, that's really important mm -hmm. and, and speaking the common language. Any challenges that you actually faced? I think for me, um, as an instructional coach here in our district and just, you know, as a teacher in general, I think some of the biggest challenges was actually changing practices, you know when you have been entrenched in a way of doing things for a very long time, um, when you've taught things the same way for a very long time, and now someone's coming along and you feel as though um, this is so different. But when you actually dig into it and you follow, for instance, the CKLA curriculum, it's systematic. So when you follow that, um, you have a body of evidence, one that's showing that the science works, but also a way to systematically present the instruction in front of students to where it's not something that's so far-fetched or so different. Um, I know like in kindergarten, some of our kinder teachers that have been kinder teachers for years, making that shift from teaching just letters in isolation first to actually introducing students to sound um, and then developing their ears, then presenting those, the letter sound, not necessarily talking about the graphing, the, actually, the actual symbol was different. But over the past five years, we've seen people embrace that understand the why behind it so that, mm. shift, that fight we had with that shift in thinking that shift in mindset i think you mentioned um that about that new thinking yep has really caused people now to embrace um that this is the way this is the, the approach that's really getting my children getting my students um to become better readers um being able to understand um, literacy in a whole different way um it is created by in but it came through exactly what you were talking about introducing people to those new skills through professional development. And then once they were bought into that and you start seeing those um, that new thinking through data, through that quantitative piece of data, the impact that is beginning to have, we begin to celebrate small wins a lot here in Cato. And um, as we've done that over the past few years, we just see student growth improving. We see student teacher knowledge, because uh, that to me is the first, that that's the first step, getting mm. the teacher knowledge. Right. Um, that shift in that thinking with that building their capacity. Once we do that, that transfer will come and it will get bigger 
you know, over time. And so I think that has been the biggest thing for me in getting, uh, it was a challenge initially, but I think it's a hurdle that we, I'm going to say we have crossed um, in shifting of thinking. We probably have some outliers, I'm sure, but the, the schools that I support, the teachers that I work alongside, I, I see them wanting to understand. I see more of what we used to five years ago, skip that introduction, you know, in the, the beginning of the teacher guide, you have your introduction. Yep. We're digging into that introduction because we understand the value of the information um, that's there when you have to present this, this um, instruction yeah. in a systematic way. So I'm going to ask you this question about um, behaviors versus, versus beliefs, right? So I think that you said that, um, mm -hmm. that first of all, um, first of all, you have to, like, you can't change people's beliefs about something. First, they have to do it and see the impact of it. And so wh what was the hardest thing about that process um, in terms of changing beliefs? Like, was it getting people to actually try it? Yes, that, that's exactly it. It was getting people to try it. It was getting, if I back up even before getting people to try it, those of us that were master teachers at the time when we first began uh, this shift, we had to build our knowledge base, um, shift our thinking. We had to practice a lot. So a lot of field testing, a lot of going into a classroom and modeling lessons to make sure we had it nailed. But through that process of us growing our capacity and our practices, we saw the shift in teachers because exactly what you were talking about, that um, behavior shift, they saw us changing our behaviors. So us changing the way we presented things. And, you know, when you worked alongside people for years, so, you know, in my district, my, everybody calls me by my last name, Mac. So they know me, right? So when yep. they see, okay, well, Mac's trying it, Mac's doing it. Let me see if there's some validity to this. And, you know, there are several others of us here that when they see you changing that behavior, that mindset, if you're buying into it, well, let me, you know, go ahead and give this a try. But then as we change those beliefs, um, those behaviors, then our belief systems, um, as you said already, begin to change because we see the impact of the instruction, the impact of that shift in mindset to the science of reading. Um, and so it created this kind of trickle down, I guess, effect mm -hmm. of people being able to say, OK, if, if these people who I know and trust, we've worked alongside each other for years, um, are making this change and they're having good success with it. Um, and then, you know, as you go around and you're coaching in classrooms, you're modeling lessons in classrooms and they see, OK, these students really did understand it when it's presented in that manner. And then over time, you know, this isn't a one and done. This is a yep. shift in mindset, a shift in thinking. So when you do this over time, the same thing, presenting this in this systematic way over time, and then you see the end result of student growth. And again, celebrating those small wins. Um, it's just important. I was telling uh, Lauren on last week that we did Dibbles testing the week before. And you mentioned that about, um, you said tiered instruction. And then sometimes mm -hmm. you have to talk about curriculum changes in screeners. Well, we just recently changed screeners back to Dibbles 8. And so we were in the field testing um, the week before, uh, week before last, week before Big Sky, and um, seeing students as they were reading and getting to certain parts of passages. And I knew what they were doing. They were doing their fingers. Um, if they got to a long vowel, they were doing the, the system. So they were actually decoding and doing a word analysis as they were reading. But it was so natural for them to do mm. that as they were reading. And so when we see that, how can you not believe in this process when students are taking ownership and they're displaying what they've learned right in front of you? And I saw that time and time again. I, can't, I don't even know how many children we tested, but we tested a lot um, during that week. And so we got to see them applying the knowledge that they've gained um, through the instruction they received. Mm -hmm. That's that's so amazing. And 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 what does that mean then in terms of, you know, I think a couple of things, sharing those stories a, across, you know, the, you know, from teacher to teacher, from educator to educator, but also then the impact of coaching. What does that, what does that do for your coaching? It, it changes the way that you coach. One thing that you you said, and it was like, it was so funny. I was just thinking about all the things I wanted to say. And I was like, she's just, just hitting every point, even about that coaching piece of it. Because once you have teachers trained on the science of reading, they go through the professional development um, through the science of reading. And so they understand the science, but then how do I apply that? And so yeah. from my lens as a coach, I have to add that 
application piece to it. So we've said here, we've gone through, you know, whatever program you, you decide to use in your district, Ames Institute, you've done letters, um, you know, back in the day, as they say, we did Foley. You've gone through all these processes, but how does that look in my district in front of the students in my classroom in my neighborhood? How does this look with that student? Um, it's easy to see it on film. It's easy to see it in a book. It's easy to sit in the class. But what does that mean to this child that I know is a struggling reader? And so when you go in as an instructional coach and you pull these groups of students with you and you become a part of the solution, not just I'm coming in to observe your classroom, not that I'm just coming in to take some notes and give you some feedback. No, I'm pulling a group of students too. I'm working with them. So I'm showing you in this systematic way what it looks and sounds like in your classroom. That is what is done for me as a coach because it's not about me going in and scripting some notes. I do that too, but I have to become a part of what's happening in the room. I have to see if it's working in front of students, how are these students responding to the instruction that they're being provided. And so that's what it's meant to me. It's made me a part of that application piece. So I'm right there in the trenches doing the work, working with kids, pulling students, seeing the end result and making the needed adjustments in the moment. I think that's my favorite piece of it is once we go in, we do the instruction, we've taught this to the students and then, okay, now what's next? What modification do I need to make in order for this kid to get it? Um, and so that piece of that, that thought process, that brain energy <laughs> that it takes to sit down and say, how do I make instruction accessible to this child? Um, I think that's one of the most important things that you can do as a coach and model for a teacher. You know, what's interesting, I was listening to you talk and what you're really doing is at the ground level, you're really doing classroom based research because you're trying to figure out what that particular student needs. And you may learn something from that particular student that you can then take and apply to another student who may be similar in that similar situation. Um, but it's yes. really a constant watching and learning and responding and reacting all to make sure that that one kid is learning what they need to do. Is that is that how you feel? <laughs> That's exactly how it is. It is like this in uh, in the tap world when we use the tap uh, district that that cycle that was five steps. And so it is going in, going right back to okay, let's let's evaluate it, let's apply this new learn that, that saying that oh, that cycle over and over again. And then like you say, okay, now that I have this roadmap, I have field tested this. When I see this again, I know that this is what worked for this student. In this situation, this is a very similar situation. I have then an entry point of what I can apply to this new situation and this new student. So exactly that is what mm -hmm. we see. I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit and see if okay. there's, can you think of, we're going to talk about a teacher first and then we'll talk about a student. Can you think of an example of a teacher that really was a little bit resistant to changing practices Maybe even they went into this and it's like, oh, I'm just going to do this to maybe prove you wrong or I'm just going to do it because I have to. And then and then you see there they actually had a change in beliefs. I just actually right before we started finished texting that teacher, she's no longer at the elementary level. She uh, went on to be a, a volleyball coach here in our district. But the scenario that you just uh, explained. So the first few years, um, fourth grade teacher. Um, not what we can, you know, historically we've considered a teacher of foundations, but we know if we follow the finest continuum, yeah, you're still a teacher yeah. of foundations, right? And so very um, reluctant, um, probably more out of the fear, maybe a lack of knowledge of what do you mean by the science of reading? What do you mean by foundations? I'm not understanding this phonemic awareness and phonics piece. So for a few years, um, very, very resistant Um I would say at least two to three, very resistant, would try here to there, would let me come in and model and then pick holes through the model um, over and over and over again. A lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions, a lot of planning sessions, a lot of, you know, coming in, watching the class, giving feedback, modeling lessons, they are recording myself doing it. You know, let's watch this. Let's talk through what you saw me do type thing, but still very, very resistant. Well, Last year and a half or so, it was like, you know what, doggone it, they're not going to give up on the science of reading thing. Let me give it a try. And so really dug in, started um, asking questions, getting the support that was needed, receiving the, the support that was already being provided. And then 
over the last, just last school year, especially best RTI, best intervention lessons. I mean, I remember going in in this past year and, you know, leaving a little note, I think I did and walk back out the room and it was like, okay, can I see you on my plan of here? And I have some questions. And then it was, so you didn't say anything. What, what do I need to do? And I said, that was a solid piece of lesson. I saw there was nothing I needed to add. I said, keep doing that instruction. Besides, it was scientific based. It was tailored to student need. It was systematic in her approach of delivery. I mean, it, it was amazing. It was solid, but a few years of very resistant, but seeing that, you know, well, this teacher's getting results and, um, Okay, I see how it works when she comes in. So let me study. Let me get into that. And I'm going to just say that is very, very key. I can come into your room as an instructional coach and I can model all day long. And we may get to this later, later but I'm going to jump, <laughs> jump in now. This takes a lot of self-study. It takes a lot of digging into your podcast, um, gaining information from different places. It, it really does take you taking advantage of the professional development that is being provided by your district. I always go back to if you're a teacher of CKLA, that introduction section is powerful. Read it. Mm, um, take yep. a note from that. Very powerful information. And like I, like I just said, your podcast, I just watched the one that you just did with um, Steve. I can't remember his last name on writing because that's one of the next things that I want to dig into. Um, but really that self-study is very, very important. And I think we need to take advantage of that because though we can model, I can help you plan. Um, it takes a huge sacrifice. It took me and it's taking. I'm not, not where I want to be. I'm still learning. I still consider myself a student 13 years later. Um, it, it, you have to you have to study. You have to really prepare yourself um, mm -hmm. for how, because it, like you, we just talked about, it is constantly um, doing research, right? Even when you're working with students, you're researching and you're seeing what worked, what didn't work. Go back to the drawing board. Let me make a modification. Let me yep. see what this person, let me see what Louise Moss has to say about this. I wonder if um, Susan Lambert has a podcast on this topic. Let me go look at that podcast. It takes that kind of motivation to get it mm. done. Yeah, that's yeah. that's powerful. A couple of things. So um, for those of you on the webinar right now, uh, the district is using, um, or the parish is using Dibbles 8 as the universal screener and yes. um, also using Core Knowledge Language Arts or CKLA as their core program. So those two programs are both science of reading based. Um, so there's that. And then Devana, we had um, oh, one other comment. Um, there was a question about who is resistant most, leadership or teachers. And I would say it's more about people, right? It doesn't necessarily mean roles, but I will tell you, if leadership is not on board to support the effort, um, it's very difficult for teachers in the classroom to, to, really, um, to really implement. And then the thing that I do want you to respond to is you talked a little bit about how you were letters trained, but now folks in your parish are going through the Ames Institute. Can you tell folks what the Ames Institute is? Um, Ames Institute was um, a series of modules it is an online training that we took. It was uh, self-paced, though it was in within a time frame. It still was self-paced um, that we went through, and it took you through the science of reading. It was a systematic approach to the science of reading, starting at the basic level. We we talked about Scarborough's rope. Um, we talked about the hourglass. We we went through that system of study. Um, so for me, it was like letters. If any of you have been letters changed trained or done that PD, but to a different level, um, it was. Almost like taking a college course, but one that I <laughs> one that I completely um, enjoy taking. And so we did the structured literacy, um, and I've taken another uh, course through AIM since then. But the one that we all had to do was the one on structured literacy, and it was that nice. just that it took you through that structure of, of literacy, gave you a little bit of history and background, but then took you through systems. The thing that I like the most is that for various topics there were videos with live real children where you got to see how this could look in front of your students mm -hmm. and so as a coach i was able then to use that as a model for when i would go into the classroom and work yep. with um, yep. students in front of teachers right well thank you for sharing that and i wish we could go on and on but we're coming yeah. up against time um for for folks that are still with us, thank you very much. You can um, you can see this continuing conversation happen. Um, and again, join us on Science of Reading the podcast. Join us on Science of Reading the community, where you can throw more questions into that Facebook group. 
Um, but with that, I think Lauren, we are going to, oh, thank you so much, Devon. It was, it was super great. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to invite welcome. Lauren back up to sort of close us off and give us the next information. Great. Thank you so much, Susan and Giovanna. What a wonderful presentation. So, so much insight and so much information for educators on, uh, joined us today to take back to their schools and districts. So thank you both again for being here today. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. I want to take a moment to in, invite you all to continue the conversation um, at our un upcoming virtual event, Science of Reading the Symposium, What the Science of Reading Means Now on October 10th. And I will drop the link into the chat here as well so that you can uh, register to join us. Make sure to mark your calendar. And thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day.